all of us gardeners have bucket list plants. And for me, one of those bucket list plants has always been lupin or lupine. Either way is correct. Today, I don't know whether to be jealous or angry or thrilled. And maybe I'm a little bit of all three because my friend Alicia Wellburn, the flower lady of Gallatin, has cracked the code to growing lupins here in Tennessee. She's gonna tell us her secrets. Alicia, you're not supposed to be able to do this here. You're not supposed to be able to grow these and uh, they're just gorgeous. I can't get over it. Well, thank you. Um, well, I'm a pretty stubborn gardener. Yeah. And I like to try things that no one else can do. Well, I thought I was a stubborn gardener, but I gave up after 20 years <laughs> and you, you and didn't. I, and I thought you were a better gardener than me. <laughs> you got me on this one. <laughs> I love the color range of these. It's, you've got everything from pink to blue, mm -hmm. purple. Some of them have a little white. That's the first time I've had that by color. Uh-huh. Um, but no red. There's supposed to be a red, the elusive red. The I, elusive I, red. I don't have it. I noticed a yellow one behind us, kind of a creamy pale uh -huh. yellow. That's my first. Yeah. And some of them, like you mentioned, are solid colors and some of them have the little white center in them. Some and then of them I have see yellow actually one over there that looks like it's maybe it's just the shadows but it's pink and looks like it's a little darker in the yeah in the center they're just so beautiful and even the foliage is pretty i think so and when the rain comes the little droplets look like you know of water beat yeah, up yeah it's just just absolutely gorgeous so beautiful and this is the most lupins i've ever had there's probably 200 in here yeah all various uh, sizes and you know stages how long have you been trying to grow them and when did you have your kind of first success? My first success was probably when you were here five years ago. Yeah. And I only had a few. Yeah, they were just a handful. And when you made such a big fuss over them, I thought, <laughs> I can do better than this. Right. Last year, they were looking really, really good. Uh -huh. And I was inviting people over to see them. And um, I had tried planting them in the spring I didn't think that was working so well. Right. I was using, you know, several packets of seeds and getting five or six. Right. Then I realized they don't like the summer. They were melting out. Mm -hmm. During the heat and humidity. So I thought, let's try fall. Okay. Because it's cool. And try to bypass the summer and see if they have enough time to actually mature since they are biannual. Right. And uh, it worked. Uh, may not get... 18 blooms per plant, but I'm getting at least eight to 10. But you're getting, gosh, just, I mean, better success than anybody I've ever seen really anywhere south of the northern tier of the United States. I mean, you see them in the Pacific Northwest and you see them up in Maine and Vermont in the mm -hmm. summertime and, you know, those places. But, you know, any anywhere south of Ohio, it's pretty much just, you know, a given that you're not going to be able to do it. And here we are. And I've had a few. That bunch over there is actually its uh, third year. Wow. So they actually have been perennial for you and survived the summer once they were established. Mm -hmm. If you can get them large enough to not melt out. Right. Back a month and a half ago, I pulled out about 12, potted them up, and I thought this probably won't work. But it took them three to four weeks to acclimate. Mm -hmm because they have a tap root. They're oh, in the, yes. you can tell by looking at the flower that they're in the pea family. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but they have a, a very tap root sort of system on them and to dig that up is makes not, them not unhappy. Easy. Yeah. yeah. You probably and have to get a really big root ball and you do. try to not let it fall apart. Yeah, don't let the, you know, the soil fall apart mm -hmm. on it. And I noticed, you see how deep green these are? Mm -hmm. Of course, part of that is probably the nitrogen fixing to the plant. Right. But I did use uh, triple 15 uh -huh. a couple of times. Yeah. Try not to do that too much because um, I think that link you sent me to that nursery in England said that they would rot out if they had too much nitrogen. Nitrogen, yeah. Well, I do want to get into the details of how you do this. So let's take a little walk and look at some other things and, and talk about how you have so much success. Okay. This is the very beginning. The very beginning. A packet of seeds. It's only seeds. And they're not very big. 
You know, they're the size of, they almost look like a lentil, which is also in the pea family. Right, you know, exactly. all these plants are, are related. And so at this stage, what do you do? I get out a little container like that one right there, uh -huh. fill it with warm water. Right. And the packet, some of the packets will tell go. you uh, 24 hours to soak, but I actually do it for 36. Okay. Because it's really hard, you know, that's a hard shell. A very hard seed coat, which is not uncommon in legumes. Right. In plants in the pea family. Then I'm assuming there's some bed prep involved yeah. before you actually plant. But, but not really a whole lot. You don't have to amend the bed. Mm -hmm. you, you know, last time I told you I'd put sand in the bed. Not this time, mm -hmm. there's no sand. No manure, because you don't want that, you know, right. for lupins. Right. Uh, just get in the bed and uh, cultivate it down to about three or four inches. Mm -hmm. And then put your seed out, barely cover them. And then, like I said, the hard part is keeping them watered every day. That bed has to stay moist right. in order for them to germinate. Of course, I start this in late summer or early fall okay depending on when the night temperatures start going down so early september to May, late september i this last year i started late august okay so it just depends on when the night temperatures begin to drop to what into the, the 60s 50s 50s okay you don't have to get down in the 40s right. yet but you know sometimes in late august we do get down yeah we get a little cold snap and it starts to uh, just so that it's not so bit. hot that I can't keep the bed watered. Right. And that gives them just a little bit longer to make a, you know, a nice rosette. A nice rosette. Because like you mentioned earlier, they are technically biennial. Mm -hmm. So if you can give them long enough in that late summer, fall growing season, yes. we don't have a hard freeze maybe until early November, uh, then they have two and a half, three months to really get established. Course, you know what happened in December. Yes. yes. And they went through that fine. What I, I was worried was in March because they were forming, starting to form their buds. Buds, they were big and green and lush when we had that later freeze in March. So I got out the sheets, mm -hmm. covered every bit of this bed. Right. Of course I had peonies and everything else to, to do, but this yeah. was the priority. Sure. So once they're sown, how long does it take them to germinate usually? Uh, some of them came up within three days. Wow. You know, it can take uh, 14 to 28 days. Yeah. And, you know, they kept coming up. But I noticed even this spring, there was still some coming a up. A few, yeah. Yeah, which I, I they just, just needed a little cold weather over the winter or something to get them kick just, started. You know, I'm, I'm just rolling with the flow when it comes to these lupins. Yeah. So are you collecting seed now? Oh, yes. I, yes. Last year I collected four or five gallon buckets of seeds. And these are some that actually started flowering probably a couple of weeks ago. A yeah, um, month ago. A month ago. Yeah. And you can see here that they flower from bottom yes. to top. And these are the pods that are beginning to form. And they do look like peas. They soybeans, definitely look like. You know. Um, and they will plump up a little more as the seeds form and they will turn black and split uh -huh. open um, just like any other legume. Right. And I will harvest these, put them in the buckets and save them till the, you know, this winter when I have time to work on them. Sure. And you notice they are deep green. They are deep green. And part of that is because they can also fix their own nitrogen. Yes, exactly. Like a lot of plants in the legume family. Um, they have these little nodules on their roots yeah. that you can see. Uh, this is just here. a smaller plant, but you can right. see a few of them. And so inside of those nodules are um, actually little bacteria that live and are able to fix nitrogen uh, from the air uh, and, and make it available to the plant. And what I've noticed that all the other plants that are in here, uh, Coreopsis, I even had some Gallardia, which I've taken out and put in other places. Uh -huh. But they're they're a lot bigger and more robust plants. And because I, they have the lupins there it's helping e improve it's the either, soil. It's either the lupins or because I'm giving the lupins so much it's care. A little, yeah, or a little, a little both. both. You mentioned Coreopsis. What other companion plants do you grow? I, I know the lupins are going to come and go in about a month or six yes. weeks time. And well, my staples in there, I, I still have herbs 
in yeah. the middle of this bed. Mm -hmm. uh, oregano, I've got some lavender in pots. There's chives blooming, a little bay laurel and uh, some oxeye daisies, just to give it some uh, contrast. Right, and to keep the, the bed flowering throughout yeah. the summer and th so that you don't just have a big dead space out here. At, it's just and like, not dead, but yeah. non-flowering. It's just like when you plant peonies, you, you don't want them all by themselves. Right something to come up amongst them or in front of them or whatever exactly. after they've finished their big display. I have roses with my peonies, so. So what will be the routine then? Um, obviously, what's in bloom now are going to go to seed like we showed. You cut those seed pods once they begin to mature and split. Mm -hmm. And But I'll still have a few more flushes to come on. So you could buy just a few packets of seeds to get yourself started and then mm -hmm. from there on, if you're, if you're willing to do a little work and put a little effort in, you can collect, save your own seeds and, exactly. and uh, um, have them from year to year. You probably get um, per flower, I would say, as many seeds that are in a packet. Wow. Per flower. Per flower, not per stalk, but per mm -hmm. individual flower. That's amazing. Each year I buy new seed packets because, um, you know, I want more variety in mm -hmm. the colors and uh, you wind up usually with just one or two colors. Right. You a know. lot of purple and pink and yeah. those shades and you're still after the I'm, elusive yes, red. Yes, I'm still looking for her. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. And sometimes you'll get some deeper yellows, buttery mm -hmm. kinds of yellows. Like and... this time I, I did have the creamy yellow. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well. You've obviously cracked the code and you've been more persistent and more successful than I ever have. So thank you for sharing these incredibly beautiful flowers with us. And I do hope that people will try this, but they just need to be consistent about watering their seedlings. Mm -hmm. For inspiring garden tours, growing tips, and garden projects, visit our website at volunteergardener.org or on YouTube at the Volunteer Gardener channel and like us on Facebook.